half from these will not give any points. Oop. So checking a graph from these will not bring any points. So don't don't bother with that. Okay. So let's start the problem from scratch. So this is f of x equals 1 half x squared for x less than 3 and 5x minus 10 for x greater than 3. We're asked to graph this function and the first thought I have is, what is it? Perfect. It's a piecewise defined function. What is my second thought for any function that I need to graph? The excellent, the domain. So now, I'm going to change this into an interval notation. <clears throat> and I'm going to change this into an interval notation. Can anyone give us the interval notation for the first one? Perfect. And for the second one? Yes. Bracket 3 to infinity. Now, I would like to identify the domain of this function. Can anyone tell us, looking at this interval and this interval, for the entire function, what is the domain? Because you can say, this one is defined here. True. This one is defined here. True. But I'm interested in the entire function. All your numbers. <clears throat> Do we all agree with that? Very good. Which is the x value that is absolutely crucial here? Yes. Other values will be important as well. 0 must be in the chart all the time. But 3 is the crucial value. Because right under 3, I'm going to use this symbol facing left and this symbol facing right. And they're touching symbols. There is no gap between the two of them. And they have to be right under 3. Then I'm making myself another note. I know you, you say she and her notes. Yes. I'm two people, myself and my notes. No, I'm kidding. So I'm making myself a note saying, don't forget. On this piece, you must use 1 half x squared. And on this piece of the real line, you must use, or I must use, 5x minus 10, because that's what it says. So I don't make a mistake. Maybe this fits on the previous page. And then I have to turn the pages back and forth. I'd rather have it right here on top of the chart. Because I see 2 in the denominator, I'm going to choose negative 2 and 2, because I can simplify. If I choose, for example, negative 1, then I'll have to plot 0.5. But if I choose something that is divisible by 2, then I will be an integer. So now, do you have to do this? No, you can choose any point, any x value on the left-hand side of 3. So negative 2 squared, how much? Divided by 2. 0. 2 squared divided by 2. 2. I have to plug in 3, and you can say no, but I still have to. So 3 squared is 9. 9 divided by 2, 4.5, and I write it right here inside of the parentheses. Why? Because 3 comma 4.5 will be what type of point? Very good. Yes, it will be an open point. What type of point will be 3, 5? Yes, because it's in, inside of the parentheses, and the parentheses is included. They are inside of the bracket, and the parentheses is not included, and the bracket is. OK, I'm going to use 4, which is 10. That's all we need. And then we will identify the range. From left to right, please give me the first or the pair. Very good. Next one. Oh. Next one. Yes. The next one is zero, zero. The next one. The next one, two, four and a half. What type of point again? 
good. I know how to graph a quadratic function, right? This is quadratic. Make sure you don't graph it as a straight line or as an absolute value or as a radical function or cubic or anything else. It's quadratic. Now the next point. What type of point is 3 comma 5? Good. And then 4 comma 10. We're asked to write the range. Yes. From the lowest y value, this continues forever. Bracket, 0 to infinity. Very good. Next problem? Yes? OK, so we have 21. Use the given conditions to write the equation of the line. So we are given two ordered pairs, negative 4, comma, negative 5, and 4, comma, 7. We're asked to find the equation of the line passing through these points. So we have to find what first? Yes, we must find the slope. So the slope of the line, I recommend you're, you're going to have plenty of time to finish up this test. Um, so there is no rush. I would recommend identify or label, if you want, those ordered pairs so you don't make an error. So 7 minus negative 5. <coughs> Very good. 4 minus negative 4. Very good. So the top is 12, the bottom is 8, simplify by 4, 3 halves. Now, what do I have to use? And I'm asking myself, well, I want to use the easiest of the two if possible. But do I have the y-intercept? No, I don't have a, a point that is 0, comma, a number. For that reason, I am forced to use y minus y1 equals the slope times x minus x1. Which point do you want to use? It doesn't matter. I can use the second one, you can use the first one. We'll still get the same equation. Second one. So this is um, 7 and this is 4, and the slope is 3 halves. All I have to do is just plug them in. So y minus 7 equals 3 halves x minus 4. I have to distribute 3 halves x. If you have any difficulties in multiplying, take it aside. 3 divided by 2 times 4 over 1. Always simplify first before you multiply. I simplify by 2, and I get the answer to be, but it's minus. So minus 6, and then I have to bring a positive 7 to the other side. It was negative on the left. It's positive on the right. So the equation is y equals 3 halves x plus 1. What does it represent? It's the equation of the line that passes to the given points. Y1. Isn't that negative 5? Um, yes, uh, um, see, the, the nota it's a very good, very good question. This notation refers to any particular point. It doesn't mean that I have to use the one that I labeled x1, y1. As long as I pick the x and the y correctly. I cannot pick this y and this x. But as long as I pick from the same point and I say this is my uh, y1 and this is my x1, I will get the same answer. As long as I'm careful and um, pick from the same point. So this is my y1 and this is my x1. The reason why I, I didn't pick this is because one of your colleagues said let's pick the second one. So that's how I chose. But this is a generic name. This is a generic name in, in the formula. But it can be... It, it can come from any ordered pair that is given to us. And of course, it must be an ordered pair that we use to determine the, um, the slope because we don't have other points. Yes, please. Sorry. What are the tests? Do you want us to write like slope, point, slope, line, equal, <coughs> and equal to the equation? 
Um, it, whatever it's easier for you, that's a very good question. So I, I do this, I write the equation for everyone to see what I'm doing. I write them underneath and then write it again. Okay. Um, unless you have something easier for yourself, I'm fine. Yeah. So uh, the reason why I don't like to write it three or four times with parentheses, 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 because sometimes I may lose track of, of those grouping symbols. But if it's easier for you to write uh, y minus, uh, I don't know, negative 7 equals um, 1 half x minus negative 2, and you can perform the operations from there, it's fine. But I try to avoid uh, using too many parentheses. They're called nested parentheses. I may lose track of what I'm doing. The point slope form, the point slope form is this. The slope, slope intercept form is this, y equals mx plus b. But I can use this point slope form. I can use it. I'm sorry, I can use the slope intercept form only if I have a number like this, an ordered pair like this, 0, 0,5. Okay. Let's say I'm given that the slope is 3 halves, and one of the points is 0, 0,5. Then all I have to do is just substitute, and I'm done. Okay. So this will become y equals uh, 3 halves x plus 5, and it's done. Okay. But if I, sure, my <coughs> pleasure. But if I don't have 0, a number, I should not. I know in high school or, you know, some time ago you were taught that. You were given this and you were find the, the y-intercept first and then you have, you created another point and blah, blah, blah. So this is like doing this. It's nothing wrong, right? But there is no need. We have, that's, the, that's why we have this. That works for any point, including this point. But if I have this point, I don't want to go through all that. It's easier if I just use mx plus b, but only if that point is given to us. Does it make sense? Any questions? Uh, we did this last time. We can do it again if you want to, but I think I saw it uh, when we went through. Yes? Is everyone okay with not doing it? It's okay if you say, I want to see it again. I don't have any problem with that. We move on? Because some of you may, may have missed last time, so I, I'm willing to do it again if need be. Okay, so now let's look at uh, 23. In 23, we are given a point, 9 comma negative 5, and perpendicular to the equation x minus 5, y minus 3 equals 0. So here's the idea. We are asked to determine the equation of this line, we do not have the equation of this line. This is what we want to determine. And we know it passes through a point that is given to us, which is 9 comma negative 5. We are also given a second piece of information. We are told that this line, the unknown line, is <coughs> perpendicular, perpendicular to uh, a line whose equation is x minus 5, y minus 3 equals 0. Since I do not have the y-intercept, I will be thinking of the point-slope form, and the point-slope form is y minus y1 equals the slope times x minus x1, where I plug in 9 and negative 5, but without a, a very important piece of the puzzle, I can't continue. How do I determine the slope? So I need to determine this. Let's call it M1. And if I find M2, which is the slope of this line, correct. Or if you like to remember it easier, M1 times M2 must equal, that's it. It's up to you. It doesn't matter. It's the same thing. Good. But is there a way of determining M2? That's the question now. Yes. How do I, what do I need to do here to this equation, which is x? Yes. So I have to solve for y. I have to solve the equation for y. 
in order to be able to identify the slope m2. Once I have the slope m2, I will be able to find the slope m1. And this is what I need. OK, so I'm going to solve for y. I'm moving x and I'm moving negative 3. Negative 5y equals negative x plus 3. Now be careful when you try to find the slope. Please do not do this. We have to divide term by term. Negative 5y divided by y is, I'm sorry, negative 5y divided by negative 5 is y. Negative 1 <coughs> divided by negative 5 is 1 fifth x. Exactly, and 3 divided by negative 5 is this. So now we know that this is our m2. If m2 equals 1 fifth, how much is m1 knowing that the product must be negative 1? Do you all agree with negative 5? Is 1 over 5 times negative 5 over 1 negative 1? Yes. So therefore, m1 is indeed negative 5. So now I can put it in, in the equation. That's all I needed. I needed to find the slope, and we did. Is it clear why this slope is negative 5? It's OK if you say no. Is it clear why it's negative 5? Yes, yes, yes. So we solved this equation for y. So we moved x to the other side, it became negative. We moved negative 3 to the other side, it became positive. Then we divided by this number because I have to solve for y. This is not solved for y yet. So negative 5y divided by negative 5 is y. Negative 1 divided by negative 5 is 1 fifth x. And 3 divided by negative 5 is negative 3 fifths. I'm comparing this to the equation y equals mx plus b, and I realize that the slope m2 is 1 fifth by comparison. y to y, a number times x, and whatever, free term. So therefore, the number in front of x must be the slope. Once I know that this slope is 1 fifth, and I put 1 fifth in here, this must be negative 5 because negative 5 times 1 fifth will be negative 1. Why do I know this? Because they are perpendicular. They, are, they told us that these two lines are perpendicular. If they were parallel, I would have used the same slope, not thinking of this. But they are perpendicular. So if this is 1 fifth, then this must be negative 5. The product has to be exactly negative 1. Not 1, not 5, not negative 3. So once we have that, we have the point already plugged in, in a way. So I have y minus negative 5. I don't need to use parentheses. So I will write y plus 5. And then I have negative 5 as the slope and x minus 9 in parentheses. I don't care for, yes? No, I only want it solved for okay. y. I don't care. So the other, so you're um, raising an excellent point. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to finish this in a second. Uh, this is what it's called the general form. I will never ask you about this. It's useless. You can. It doesn't mean anything. You can't. It doesn't tell us anything. It doesn't tell us the slope. It doesn't tell us the y-intercept. Without solving for y, I will not be able to read anything. So it is completely useless. Uh, it's, uh, it's an important form. We're not going to do anything with it other than when we get to systems. But we are not going to need to look at uh, and call it the general form. So I don't need this. So this is negative 5x, and this is positive 45, but I have to bring a negative 5 from the left. So the last step is this. That's it. Because I have so many different things that I can, I shouldn't say so many, but it's very clear. The slope is negative 5. The y-intercept is 
0, 0, comma, the y intercept. Exactly. So the y intercept is 0, comma, 40. And the slope is negative 5. That's why this is a useful form. This one is useless. So, when we do the, in general, do you want us to write down the form on the test, even though it says two? I don't need it. Okay. Go on with the break in the middle. If you want to write it as a general form, you can. Here's, here's what we have to do. We have to move everything to one side. And put the x first, 5x plus y minus 40 equals 0. Useless. It doesn't tell us anything. Very good. Uh, next one, number 24. We're talking about the life expectancy for females between 50 and 60. So uh, it says the graph of the right and uh, on the right shows the remaining life expectancy e in years uh, for females of age X. Find the average rate of change between the ages of 50 and 60. Describe what the average rate of change means in this situation. So between 50 and 60, I have these two points. All I have to determine is the slope of the line passing through those. That's what the average rate of change is. So I will have 25.2 minus 33.8 over 60 minus 50. So the average rate of change is the same with the slope of the line passing through those points. Sixty minus fifty. It has to be in that order. And before I even uh, write it, do you think it's going to be a positive slope or a negative slope? Mm -hmm. Right. So be very careful because we knew that. Okay. So the average rate of change in this case will be 25.2 minus 33.8 and we have to keep x in the same order 60 minus 50 and tell me what you get so 25.2 minus 33.8 as you see I'm lazy tonight divided by 10 is negative 0.86 negative 0.86 without the measurement unit I cannot give full credit so let's look again. The measurement unit is a ratio of two measurement units, one coming from the top and one coming from the bottom. The top is measured in years. Years. And the bottom is age group. So let's interpret this. Um, between the ages of 50 and 60, very depressing, um, According to the formula, we hope that it's wrong, but according to the formula, the life expectancy for females decreases with, by almost one year from the ages between 50 and 60. Okay? So then it's asking uh, if uh, the average rate of change between 70 and 80 is negative 0 0.43. So it decreases each year. Life expectancy decreases each year between the ages. So, okay, same here. By one, almost one year, each year. Okay? So life expectancy decreases each year between the ages of 70 and 80 by 0.43. So the life expectancy decreases faster. The rate of change is faster for, for women between 50 and 60, but slower for women between 70 and 80, according to the model. So bottom line, if you pass 70, you have the chance, higher chances of getting probably to 100 uh, than if you pass 60, or you're between 50 and 60, according to the model. We hope it's wrong. Okay, so the last one, I think is the last one here. Uh, again, choosing something from the graph does not mean anything. So we have to look at this function. We have to present the base function. We have to present the uh, transformations in the correct order and graph them. I don't care if we choose anything here, I'm not looking at that. OK. Very simple function. We looked at way more difficult. So in class, age of x equals the absolute value of x minus 3 minus 6. <coughs> 
which is the base function used here, the absolute value of x. So perfect. Bless you. Number one. Number one is a transformation, the first transformation in order of operations on the absolute value. The absolute value of x minus 3, which means, awesome, right 3. Um, I'm still thinking about um, the life expectancy. I, uh, let me finish this before we, before I tell you the story. Yes, which is down 6. Very good. I will be graphing the absolute value of x, and I know exactly it's a v function. That's the absolute value of x. And you told me to move this graph three units to the right. I completely agree. Parallel, make it as parallel as possible. I'm not going to look with a magnifying glass, but it should be parallel. And then you told me to move this graph um, down six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Here it is. And I'm going to try again to make it as parallel as possible. So this is the graph of age of x. And this is the graph of x minus 3 in absolute value. It's not, in my opinion, not a long test, not a difficult test. I don't want you to finish in 15 minutes. Don't do that. Yes? I was wondering if you could write the original formula for that. Like, formula for the average rate? For no, for uh, the H, H of X. Yeah. Like, I forgot, I forgot what it was called, like the original one. The absolute value? No, no, like, where, where so, the original one, so like, um, that one goes, like, I guess the rule for each one, I don't know how to explain it. Um, when I change X, it's a transformation mm -hmm. on, um, a horizontal transformation. When I change y, is a vertical transformation. Um, changing from x to x minus 3 moves the graph uh, to your right, 3. Uh, this is a transformation in y because from here, here, I'm not changing x. I'm changing the y value. So that's why this graph goes down 6. If, because this is outside, it does not touch x. If it touches x, it changes x. Okay. But if it doesn't touch x, it changes y. Is that what you had in mind? Yes, I'm sorry, yes. Kayla? Can you do another completed Yes, of course. Of course. You think that if you torture me with a complete square, I'm not going to put one on it? Uh, I um, so you're all very sweet, so I'm going to say this. No, I did not put a complete square, but I want to show you. Because it's going to be part of the second test. Why is it going to be part of the second test? It's because at the end of the chapter, you will see where we really use the complete square. So let's do one. And the story that I was going to tell you is that um, I told you that one of my hobbies is um, a card game, which is not played for money or just for points and prestige. So anyway, um, and I do play with a person who is 101 years old. Sometimes he is my partner. And he's the funniest man alive. There are like 80 people in the room, and he tells me a joke. And I said, John, just tell it to everybody. And he whispers in my ear and says, look at them. They're old. They can hear, let alone understand my jokes. You understand? You're not going to waste a joke on them. I said, okay. But everybody's younger than he is. It's an amazing, he's an amazing person. Amazing. <coughs> yes, ready? Complete the square. Okay, so this is um, a quadratic equation. I make myself a note that I have to present two solutions. And the uh, problem is this, the uh, text or the requirement of the uh, problem is solve using, using completing the square. So first of all, I'd like to clean it up, and I will move this 7 to the other side. 
in no other method, right, I will do that. If it's factoring, I don't do that. If it's quadratic formula, I don't do that. But for complete the square and taking square roots, yes. So I have x squared minus 4x equals 13 because I subtract 7. Now the method has four steps. The first step is to identify the middle coefficient. Okay, I did. Second step is from the formula, from the special products we talked about, we divide this by 2. The third step is I square this number, and I get 4. And the fourth step is I add 4 to both sides. So I get x squared minus 4x plus 4 equals 13 plus 4. And remember, it must be on both sides. Otherwise, you change, we change the problem, and we cannot do that. OK, so now the left-hand side, that's why if you, you can say, I agree if you do say that, that I tortured you with this from day one. That was the first thing we did because it pops up every time we meet. Every class, this pops up. So now I have to remember what I squared to get this. And the answer is? Uh, you're correct, but, but only remember if this is minus, it has to be x minus 2. So as you see, this method alone does not solve the problem. I have to take the square root from both sides, which is a totally different method, which has nothing to do with completing the square. So because I made myself, oh, no, I didn't, two solutions, I cannot forget to write x minus 2 equals Yes. And of course, I'm going to add 2. One of the students today from a different class uh, asked me what I um, thought. I made it clear, but, <clears throat> but maybe I didn't. So he said, but the square root of 16 is plus or minus 4. So I'd like to talk to, about this for one minute, just one minute. So. We know the graph of the square root of x, correct? And we have to remember it, that is this, right? So I have the square root of 16. So let's say 4, uh, 8, 12, 16. So when x is 16, how much is y? There is only one answer, right? So this is not correct. Never say that the square root of 16 is plus or minus 4. Now, if we graph this function, which is we did graph last time, is the square root of x. For this function, you could say that the square root of 16, when I plug in the square root of 16, I get 4, and I multiply by negative 1, what do I get? Right, but this is a totally different function. This is the square root of x, but this piece is negative the square root of x. So we only, we only write plus or minus when we are solving an equation, not when I take the square root of 25. When I take the square root of 25, it's 5. But when I solve the equation, x squared equals 25, and I take the square root from both sides, that's the only time I write plus or minus 5. Say it again. Right, but remember what we said. Basically, this is the correct step. But we don't write this anymore. We just jump directly, and this equation has x equals 5 or negative 5. So we don't write this anymore, and we jump from here, here. But no square root has plus or minus as the answer. Only when we solve equations by the square root property then we get the plus or minus. Any questions? We do have, uh, as I, we agreed, six more minutes. So let's choose something that you can think of and say, I really, really need one more of this or one more of that. Yes. Yes, please, anything. Anything. <coughs> It says the 
The rest of the points yeah, just this one. I don't care. About so that. just this one. Yes. Okay. But it's it's uh, one. It's not five. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Yes. Thank you. So can you please choose uh, anything that you would say? I I really need to see one more. Yes. Can, can I look for a second? There's, there's a few, but I want to choose. Yes. Yeah. We have it? Yeah, I think so. Can we do those number seven? Yes. Yeah. So we have, oh, this Sorry. one, yes. x minus the square root of 5, x minus 6 equals 4. Very good. Thank you. Okay, so we are given an equation. What type of equation is it? So this is x minus 5, x, the square root of 5, x minus 6 equals 4. What type of equation is it? It's a square root or a radical equation. Very good. Can anyone recommend the first step here? Yes, I'm going to subtract 4 and <coughs> move the radical to the other side. I need to isolate the radical. x minus 4 equals the square root of 5x minus 6. A radical equation requires to separate the radical from the rest. Okay, what will be the next step? Yes, now I square both sides. Not term by term, but everything at once. x squared minus 8x plus, very good, equals, very good. Do we all understand this step? Okay, what type of equation is this now? Very good, so I have x squared and then I'm using the zero product principle, x equals and x equals. I have no idea whether they work or not. I have to go back to the original problem. Here's the original problem. I'm going to try two first. Five times two. Ten minus six. Let's go to four. Two minus two. I am checking 11. 5 times 11. 55 minus 6. Let's go to 49. How much is 11 minus 7? So 11 is acceptable. Yes. Is this better? Any questions? Is there anything else that you would like to work on for the next two minutes? I apologize that I can't have a review session.